Welcome everyone to The Real News Network. My name is Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief here at The Real News, and it's so great to have you all with us. In the description of his blockbuster 2021 book, Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World, 1471 to the Second World War, author Howard French lays out his project thusly, quote, Traditional accounts of the making of the modern world afford a place of primacy to European history. Some credit the 15th century age of discovery and the maritime connection it established between West and East. Others, the accidental unearthing of the, quote, new world. Still others point to the development of the scientific method or the spread of Judeo-Christian beliefs and so on ad infinitum. The history of Africa, by contrast, has long been relegated to the remote outskirts of our global story. What if, instead, we put Africa and Africans at the very center of our thinking about the origins of modernity? End quote. Especially for people living in the West and in the global North, and especially for those of us living here in the heart of U.S. empire, the relegation of Africa and Africans to the outskirts of our collective imaginations is a constant that persists to this day. As someone employed in the news industry, I can tell you firsthand that this systematic deprioritization of stories from and about the vast continent of Africa and the 1.4 billion people who live there, who make up about 17% of the world's population, is a problem that is general and widespread. And the real news is frankly not immune to this. Yes, we are a small independent outlet doing the best we can to cover news from the front lines of struggle around the globe. But we do not provide nearly enough consistent coverage of such stories happening in and across Africa. As the editor-in-chief of The Real News, I can assure you we are working hard to correct this, but there's a larger question to reflect on here. Why? Why is it so hard to get people to pay attention to this vast, diverse, important swath of the world? And as the 21st century stage for a new era of global competition for economic, political, and military influence in Africa from the likes of the United States, China, Russia, India, Turkey, and more, and as Africa itself becomes one of the critical sites of resource extraction in the fossil fuel and green energy wars, and as Africans themselves bear a disproportionate amount of the disastrous effects of the climate emergency, will that perpetual relegation of Africa to the status of second-class concern change? And if so, will it change for the better? To talk about all of this and more, I'm honored to be joined on the Real News Network by the great Nia Akuete, a Pan-Africanist originally born in Ghana and now based in the United States. Akuete is a policy analyst and activist and the founder of the Democracy and Conflict Research Institute based in Accra, Ghana, and he is the former executive director of Africa Action and editor at TransAfrica. Ni, nee, thank you so much for joining us today on The Real News Network. Max, the honor is all mine. Thanks for having me back. Um, as I said, it, it is no secret that in the world of English language media, especially here in the global north, news about Africa and Africans always takes kind of a backseat to news from other parts of the world. So I guess I wanted to ask you, um, with all of your wealth of experience, um, why do you think that is? And, and how is our understanding of the world that we inhabit distorted by this perpetual manufactured blindness? Thank you. I think it's a, it's a wonderful question. It's a great question. It's the right question to ask because um, um, another way of putting it, I might say, is the... the, the coverage of Africa by US media, but also by the media of the developed world, the Western world, is so flawed. And I think the first place I would like to start is to point out that the, the, it is self-defeating. It imposes a cost on those countries. But you, you are right, we should start at why does it happen? 
I um and I've been agonizing over this, Max. I have to tell you, it's almost um I almost every day, at least every week, when I wake up and I look at how bad the coverage of Africa is, <laughs> it, it hits me between the eyes. And so the question is why? And I've been reflecting on this for a while. I, I think that there is more than one reason. But the first reason I choose to highlight, the one that I think we have to really focus on, even if we might not be able to understand it, I think is it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. It is white supremacy. We live in a world, I mean, I think, you know, recently we've had uh, the G7 in Japan. For a long time, I've thought, if you want to understand what's wrong with the world, look at the picture of the G7. It does not reflect the diversity of the globe we live on, because these are people who wield power. Now they meet over economics, but they wield a lot of political power in the UN, and they sure wield the vast power in terms of arms and security. They run the world. And that picture, if you want to put it that way, is a white supremacist uh, picture. There are very few people of color in that, in that picture. So I think that's one reason. And particularly in the United States, it is, it is also very jarring because this is a country with um, close to 40 million, 40 million people of African descent. So why they wouldn't cover Africa uh, properly is, is a mystery, but I think it's because they are so focused on things that are white and Western. That's one reason. A second reason is that they are not highly um, informed about what's going on in Africa. They don't get it that what happens in Africa affects the United States affects the rest of the world. You know, we are at the beginning. I mean, you know, I think um, summer will be starting soon. We are going to get a lot of hurricanes. Hurricanes through the Atlantic that come slamming into Florida and up here through DC, uh, Baltimore, all the way into Canada. They are shaped and determined by the Sahara Desert in Africa. It is in uh, U.S. interest to be watching that and marching it, but when they when the major American news media uh, cover the weather, they will call it the world weather. They don't even look at Africa. They don't look at West Africa. Even that's where those uh, um, weather patterns are born. And uh, um, another, I guess, this one is a symptom of how bad they cover Africa. There are more, if you take, whether it's the Washington Post or the, or the New York Times, or even God forbid, the Wall Street Journal, you count how many uh, bureaus they have in say, uh, UK, Britain, one country, versus how many they have in Africa. As you mentioned, it's a vast continent, 1.4 billion people, 54 countries uh, in the UN, some of us even say it's 55 because we think Morocco is holding on to the Western Sahara, which it shouldn't. Western Sahara is a member of the African Union. So those are 55 members. The number of correspondents that they have covering the vast, the vast area of the world with thousands of languages and cultures with different people doing different things is a sliver. It, it probably none of them has maybe more than uh, two or three correspondents covering Africa. They have more covering Great Britain. And the other thing they do, even when they choose to cover Africa, the coverage is so bad. They go looking for, first they ignore the continent, then they go looking for uh, negative stories to tell. So it feeds back into what I'm saying that it is racism, it is white supremacy. The, the New York Times was caught um, um, editors there were telling correspondents occasionally when they write, and this was way back in the 50s when Ghana was getting independent, a uh, correspondent will send a story and they say, no, it's not negative enough, put in this and put in that and put in that be to, to, so that people have the view of Africa, negative view of Africa, we want them to have. And finally, one of the things that eats at me now, as I said, I've taught at Georgetown, I'm teaching at GW, I have there are many people who have big jobs in Washington, including in Congress, that used to be my students. Well, American 
journalists might say be in Addis Ababa and they talk to a couple of Ethiopians and then they will call Washington and get quotes quote unquote experts and they call Americans. They don't call people like me. They don't call any of the 5 million uh, people, I mean, African immigrants like me. And according to the Census Bureau, um, African immigrants from Africa right now are the smallest if you compartmentalize by continent. But they are the most highly educated because uh, once slavery ended, the US position seems to be we will not let you in if you are from Africa, unless you are super smart, super highly educated, and you are coming to graduate school. So average educational achievement is high; is the highest among people from, from Africa. Yet the news media, when they are talking about Africa, they don't talk to the Africans. So I'll pause it there. But what you, you put your finger on it, it hurts everybody. It hurts the US, it hurts the world, West. It also hurts Africa because a lot of things are going on that are completely ignored. But I think one of the reasons is ignorance. We're thinking that the only things that matter are things that are Western and white. <laughs> right. You know, it's uh, it's it's one of those things that uh, I always have to laugh about as as uh, a Latino um, who studied uh, kind of Latin American history in the 20th century, I feel a sort of kinship uh, with you on that front because it uh, it never fails to amaze me when U.S. media constantly sort of falls back on, you know, these racist stereotypes like, you know, the proverbial strongman autocrat in Latin America or Africa, the kind of um, just ontologically corrupt governments uh, of African or Latin American states. Uh, and these are kind of, not to, not to pretend like corruption doesn't exist, strongmen don't exist, of course they do, we know they do. But scapegoating kind of, uh, you know, black and brown countries as sort of perpetually besieged by that corruption that is just inherent to our nature gives, you know, English speaking pundits and audiences and politicians just more reason to sort of continually write us off. And yet uh, we don't call it corruption in the same way when our Supreme Court justices are bought off by billionaire political donors or when members of both parties in Congress are, you know, trading on the stock market using privileged information. That's not corruption, right? That's just, you know, right. that's all fine, right? So yeah. like, you know, we could spend all day kind of going over these these double standards, but I just sort of wanted to, to kind of add that to the discussion for folks so you guys know a little bit more about what we're talking about here. Because uh, once you start seeing that stuff, you can't unsee it. You start to really see how deep that kind of white supremacy like infects all of us in the way that we understand the rest of the world like Nia was talking about. And, you know, I want to I want to kind of um, come back to, to Howard French for a second. Yes. Right. Uh, and if folks haven't already, I would highly recommend that you check out a great interview that my colleague, the great Mark Steiner, did with Howard French um, when his book came out. Um, so you should definitely go check that out. It's on the Real News uh, podcast and YouTube archives. But, you know, French in that book uh, does a really great job of showing uh, the critical role that Africa has had uh, historically in shaping the modern world. Right. I mean, from, you know, the fact that the gold found in Western Africa was what got, you know, European nations to fund, you know, explorations uh, you know, to across the Atlantic. Right. I mean, so that's just like one key point of how you can't tell the history of modernity without also talking about uh, the role that Africa played. Um, and we can't think about, you know, where we are headed uh, without thinking about the critical role that Africa will continue to play in shaping our geopolitical reality here in the 21st century. Um, you know, in the 20th century, for instance, like in Latin America, as I mentioned, and as well as the Middle East, Africa would become one of the fronts on which the heat of the so-called Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union was most intensely felt. It was a theater uh, uh, on which, uh, you know, these sorts of like big uh, battles between world powers was played out. 
And as the site of competition between the U.S., China, Russia, etc., to establish and maintain spheres of influence as a critical center of global resource extraction, let's talk about how the big geopolitical changes that we're already seeing taking shape in the 21st century are taking shape in and through Africa. And what does that mean for people living on the continent? I, I think, again, uh, you, you, you brought up a great question. You've touched on some of the key facets of it, beginning with Howard. By the way, you know, I've known Howard for quite a while. Um, and so I, I love his book. He starts it, uh, as you mentioned, with Europeans going to Africa looking for gold, and they did get gold. But, you know, I think, especially if you are looking at the Western Hemisphere, um, the Africa connection is, is un, you cannot miss it because of slavery, because of people of African descent in both uh, North America, South America, and the Caribbean. And Howard makes the point that once they went looking for gold, they decided, oh, we might even make more money and it will, uh, it will be more profitable if we capture these people and take them to the Americas to work under bondage. Because by then they had already started decimating the local peoples of the Caribbean and of North and South America. So the connections are really huge. And I'm also so glad that you talk about the Cold War, sort of the Soviet Union, United States competition. It was also played out in Africa. In fact, I like to think that it, one of the most fascinating historical analyses that I would like to see is how the Cold War played out in Africa versus how it played out in um, East Asia, Vietnam, Korea, um, and, and China. I like to call it, you know, and, and how it played out. Of course, it played out in Europe too, the Berlin Wall. But the thing that fascinates me, and I'm, I wish I were a writer, a, a good writer to, to dive into that. I call it of, of uh, backwaters and front lines. The, the West saw those Berlin and, and Korea as a front line because they were so scared of a rising China that they wanted to block them for the Vietnam War. And they said, the goal was the same. Let's keep communism from spreading across the world. But in Africa, their uh, uh, short, careless, vicious strategy was, hey, anybody who has power in any of the African uh, uh, colonies and, and countries, if you do what we tell you, um, then we will support you. And if you if you do what we tell you, and if you kill anybody that you tell us is a communist, then you are our friend. That's how they fought, they fought the uh, uh, Cold War. I suspect, I'm no expert on Latin America at all, and it's you I'm talking to, so I shouldn't even mention, but some of it sounds to me like that might be what they use. Whereas in Berlin, and especially in Vietnam and Korea, it was like, well, if we don't want communism to seep out of China into these, uh, these areas, then we better help them develop prosperous countries, even if they don't have democracies. The strong men we support has to make sure. In Africa, there was nothing like that. But to, to the, your main point of your question, which I think is really, really great, because I think the world is struggling again. And these periodic struggles in, in Howard's book goes back all the way to the uh, 14th, uh, 15th century and talks about those struggles, who's controlling the world, who's making the rules. George Bush, his father called it the new world order. I think it's a pretty good term. So every now and then we get the new world order revised. So I tell my students, I tell people I talk to now, hey, listen, here is another revision of the new world order. It's almost like musical chairs. Who's gonna make the rules as we go down? The last one was pretty much made after the end of the second world war. Although the Soviet Union kept contending, the two allies that had won the second world cup contending, and then it came to a head over Berlin. And for various reasons, the, the Soviet Union imploded, which is what is making Putin so mad. But now we are at it again. 
And my point to the thing I'm pushing at Africans, and I'm no historian, but I keep saying history is so important. Let's look at history. Every time the big powers meet to decide the fate of the world and the rules of the road, thus far, Africans have not been there. When the popes were doing it in the 15th century, Africa was not there. Um, and then you fast forward to the 1800s, 1884, when Bismarck was doing it, Africans were not there. In the Second World War, at the end of the Second World War, when Roosevelt and, and then uh, Truman and Stalin and others were doing it, Africans were not there. And every time we are not at the table, we are on the main, we get eaten. So I'm now preaching to a few people I interact with both here and on the continent. Hey, look, it is happening again. So we need to be at the table because if we are not there, our issues don't are, are not looked at at all. And so I, I think your question is great. We are going through a revision of the new world order again. Uh, China, mainly China is bagging and say, we are big, we, we are growing fast. We need a, a place at the table and we need the rules changed. But if Africans don't speak up, if they are not there, when the rules settle, we'll find out again that it is to our great disadvantage. Again, let me stress, uh, Max, I think what you've put your finger on is so wonderful. I mean, we, we, we have talked about the deficiencies of the Western media. There are global issues that they don't even cover well. They need to understand and say and educate people that the world order is being revised again and it is going to affect all of us, Africa included. So Africa needs to be involved. I hope that later we will look at the people who have been paying attention will notice that South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, recently put together, he said he was going to make peace between Ukraine and, and Russia. And, you know, I almost fell out of my chair. So did many people. The Africans can do this. Um, I don't think they have succeeded because the Chinese and the, and the Turks and the United Nations and the Catholic Church all say, we want to bring peace. The Africans say, we want to help bring peace too. We can, we can look at that. But it's all part of this revision of the new world order. We are in a very critical uh, time in global history. And um, its impact in Africa is very important because there are things in Africa uh, positive things that those who are fighting to control the world, it's not like they are going to, their newspapers will, it may ignore Africa, but the powers that be and their corporations, I, I, I tell you, I declare, they don't forget Africa. They have been taking African resources for centuries. And I don't need to remind anybody, since our audience is likely the US, that they've been you know, your people are your greatest resources and they've been taking people out of Africa for centuries. You're right. I mean, like, I mean, that's that's kind of been the, the historical trajectory, right? Is like just what we can, when I say we, I mean like the imperial powers of uh, the, the world, like how can we extract what we need from Africa to maintain, you know, our growing hegemonies, expand our growing empires? Um, and, and, and that has obviously uh, and in unobvious ways, right, contribute to the perpetual underdevelopment of African countries to uh, the creation of economies based on um, exporting and and extracting uh, singular uh, you know sources of energy, minerals, crops. I mean, like really uh, exporting the majority of you know a, a country's internal product uh, and importing kind of cheap manufactured um, goods from other parts of the world. And, and, leaving, and leaving pollution behind. I'm no expert on Latin America, let me say again, in the, in the Americas, but I suspect that what they have been doing there has not been very different. This is how they look at, uh, quote unquote, colored parts of the world. These people, in fact, I mean, somebody like uh, Margaret Thatcher, former British prime minister, looked at one African leader and said, oh, this man is dangerous. Why? Because he wants to keep the resources in his country for the development of his country. Okay, Western countries think that resources in Africa 
were put there by God for their use. And so they think a leader is dangerous who says, we're going to protect our resources, use it for our people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, that, again, um, here in the heart of U.S. empire, you know, like we know this script all too well. Right. You know, if there are uh, world leaders of countries that are sitting on uh, resources covered, coveted by the U.S. and uh, U.S. based corporations, uh, you better watch out. Um, and again, I want to stress to to people watching and listening to this that this is like kind of the opening salvo. It's a very big sort of bird's eye view discussion. Uh, we are going to follow up on this discussion with more kind of fine grained uh, subject base uh, uh, installments and discussions where we can look kind of at, in more depth at, you know, the, the increase, the massive increases in trade and investment in infrastructure from Russia, China, uh, in Africa over the past couple decades, we're going to look more at, um, the sort of like this, this new wave of financial restructuring from international financial institutions uh, that are once again looking to capitalize on the economic position that many African countries have been left in uh, with the COVID-19 generated recession, the uh, global impacts felt by the war in Ukraine, uh, to say nothing of, you know, centuries worth of um, economic development premised upon colonial domination and extraction from the global north and the west. So we're going to kind of be digging into this in more depth moving forward, but we really wanted to get Neon to sort of like talk about the sort of the, the, the elephant in the room, the bird's eye view of like, why is it so hard to even get people to care about such discussions in the first place? place and why do we have such discussions in such a flawed and 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 uh problematic way when we actually do discuss them and so Master, I want, yes was also squeezing you mentioned it at the top of when we started climate 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 africa is again being buffeted by that so i'm hoping we can uh, squeeze in a few minutes and look at it and africa's role and in this whole climate emergency. Yeah, well, you read my mind, man, because that was going to be our, our kind of next question. Um, so because like when we're talking about resource extraction, right, I mean, Africa is going to be and already is right a critical site um, of concern, especially when it comes to the extraction of materials like lithium and cobalt, which are central to the development of green uh, technologies here in the 21st century. Um, so let, let's talk about Africa and the climate crisis for a second. Um, you know, because because even though the entire continent accounts for a tiny percentage of global greenhouse gas emissions, African countries and African people are suffering a disproportionate amount of the disastrous effects of climate change. So what does the story of the, cur the current climate crisis and the existential need to combat it. Like, what does that look like if we put Africa at the center of that story? Oh, I think I can tell you that this one African and others that I hear and others that I talk to, we look at it and we are aghast, but we need to pick our jaws off the floor and do something about it because it has many facets. To begin with, as you correctly pointed out, and I hope people are listening. You can trace climate change. I think one of the things about it that for me is uh, uh, sometimes a little worrying is, you know, if you don't pay attention, you will say, oh, this is just nature. It has nothing to do with humans. Actually, quite the opposite. It has everything to do with humans. And the science is getting better so we can trace to the fact that at the in, um, age of industrialization, the middle of the 19th century is when humans started heating up the uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, why? By making machines. So when we talk about uh, Louis Stevenson and the, and, the, and the railroad engine machines, they are burning fossil fuels and pumping uh, warming gases into the air. Now, admittedly, I will say 
when it was started, people didn't realize the impact. But after a while, we started, we've started seeing the impact. And so you can trace where those gases were, point, were, were pumped in and not to drag it on too long, 80% of it. The, the, none of the gases we put into the atmosphere goes anywhere. In fact, it stays there. So it's like a, like a blanket, which is why the earth is warming too fast. Another way of looking at it is if you are in a neighborhood and you see trash all over the street, but you know which houses have been putting that trash there, if they have colored bags or whatever, I think those are two good ways to look at it. So um, global warming is man-made, number one. It's made by humans. Number two, we can trace who did it and when they started doing it. And if you then uh, sort of sum it up from the middle of the 19th century, the 1800s, all the way to now, you, you, we've been doing it for almost 200 years. But West, the West, Western Europe, Great Britain, France, um, you know, the, the Western edge of the Eurasian continent and the United States, North America, they are responsible for 80% of it. So that's their trash in the street. And that is causing all of us sick, to, to be sick. You know, Africa, I mean, uh, China has a big presence in Africa. They are also extracting African resources. It bothers me that democracy is not a big issue for them because I think Africa needs democracy. As we do these subsequent interviews, I think it would be great to dive into democracy and why Africa needs democracy. So I, I think the countries that take democracy seriously, China has a lot of strength, but democracy is not one of them. Today is China. So they are in Africa, and so I have issues with them. But when the US now says, the, here again we go, the news media, and this is where I'll throw in, I think one of the things wrong with handling uh, climate change is how badly the Western media covers climate change. Arguably, they cover it even worse than they cover Africa, in my opinion. So one of their flaws is to say, well, the uh, uh, biggest polluter today is China. Well, China, the economic miracle was in my lifetime. It was in my daughter's lifetime. It's been only about 40 years since China started growing very fast since uh, Nixon went to China. So China may, be, may seem to be putting out more warming gases today than anybody else followed by the US, but the US and Western Europe have been doing it for almost like 160 years. If you've been putting the trash out 160 years, there's a mountain of it, you can't say, oh, that guy from, the, from the, uh, that house, the Chinese house over there, put, it, put in more than I So who has been doing it? and for how long is critical. The scientists also have come up with a great piece of data. They now look at who's been doing it for how long and how many people they have there on a per capita basis. So even if you look at how much China has been warming, you have to divide it by how many people are in China and how many people are in Africa. So as you rightly put your finger on it, Africa has put like no more than 3%. The West has put in 80% and their media will not say this is man-made. So they let people think, oh, it is you, uh, nature. We have nothing to do with it. If they were to tell Americans and Europeans, this is our trash there. And this is how we got rich. So it is, we should use some of that money to look, uh, to, to find ways to remove the trash. We should put out less trash we should be more frugal in how we consume the resources of the world. These are all ways in which we in Africa who are watching this issue think it should be handled. Stop putting out so much trash and you've made money off of it. So it is only just that you spend that money. The other piece of it is how much the effects of climate change is hammering Africa. I was born in Ghana, one of the biggest cities in Ghana, which is right on the eastern edge of Ghana on the coast with uh, Togo. It has been smashed. It call, it's called uh, Keta, about 80% of it. And in fact, locals all over West Africa say, oh, the sea is swallowing West Africa. Uh, foreign policy covered this years ago because the sea is rising. 
As a kid going to school in Accra, one of my favorite times, <laughs> I will escape from the house and go sit at the beach and read books from the library. The rocks I used to sit now, they are covered by the sea because the sea is rising. It's smashing cities, it's coming in, and the sea is warming. I come from a fishing family. My father was a fisherman. Okay, now the sea around West Africa is so hot, they can't catch any fish because the fish, like anybody else, you are too hot, you meet to a cooler place. The fish is moving away from the coastal areas of Africa. It's not just West Africa, Angola, South Africa, Somalia. They are all paying the price of the um, uh, warming seas and rising. So the fishing communities are devastated. And then, of course, inland, uh, this is, uh, is leading to both floods and droughts. Uh, you're getting more floods in certain areas, and you are getting droughts in other areas. Somalia has been harmed, uh, so they can't uh, uh, food. Uh, they can't grow their food. The animals they used to keep can't find water. So we could go on for days about how high a price. Africa is pay, paying for climate change. And again, they we have contributed, Africans have contributed 3% or less of the total gas that is creating all these problems. And when I sit here in the US and read how the media covers the climate change story so badly, and they don't mention that it is man-made, they don't mention that they made it, and they, they don't connect it to what is going on, even when you know, we, we, you know, you and I know we are in Baltimore and um, and uh, Washington. We've gone through um, bad air quality because of the burning forest in Canada. All this is link, linked to climate change, and climate change, folks, it is something that was caused by people. It is something that the West is mostly responsible for. They will rather point fingers at China. They'll say, oh, let's not talk about this. We won't stop pumping more, using more uh, uh, polluting fuel, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, well, let's look for some technology to do some miracles. The thing is, you can do things if the, if the um, political will is there. And again, I happen to think, and I teach this in some of my classes, political will is very dependent on the media. Because to me, political will is not an issue with politicians. It is an issue with those who vote for politicians. If those who vote uh, take, say an issue is serious, the politicians will find the will. When you hear there's no political will, what it means is that those who vote don't care about that issue. Well, again, I could talk to you for hours, but I've got to wrap this up and let you go. Um, but I'm very excited for uh, many more conversations uh, with you, many more conversations uh, with other folks uh, who can help us expand our reporting and analysis on key stories and struggles that are happening in and through uh, Africa. But I guess um, by like way of a final sort of plug for kind of, um, you know, the, the, that coverage and just maybe a final kind of parting word from you to our audience, I wanted to just ask if there are any particular stories or struggles uh, happening in Africa right now that you think people, especially in the West, but around the world, really need to be paying attention to right now. I do, I do. You know, we've just gone through here in the US the whole uh, Black Lives Matter movement thing. And some of my friends will say, well, it will seem as if some people don't think Africans are black because if Africans are black and we believe Black Lives Matter, African lives should matter. There are um, different kinds of conflicts in Africa. Um, a major one is terrorism. Last year, 2022, half of all the terrorists, uh, all the people who were killed by terrorists or maimed by terrorists, the victims of terrorism last year were all in Africa. But people act as if, oh, terrorism is no more an issue. The US for terrorists in the Middle East, what it did was push the terrorists into Africa. They are killing Africans. Anytime Africans need help to deal with terrorism, there are politicians who say, well, our soldiers are too precious. They shouldn't be risking their lives for Africans. It is that kind of thing. So 
Conflict in Africa is a big and worrisome issue for me. I, I have said democracy is important, climate change is important, but what, what in a country, in a continent, what nothing is important if the people are dead. And that, to my mind, too many Africans are dying, they need help. Some of it, again, you can trace to US and other Western policies why Africans are dying, we need to uh, uh, be looking at that. This is the US. The immigration on the border with Mexico is a big issue, immigration. I can tell you the immigration issue, the immigration injustice from Europe against Africans is much worse, Max. They have been allowing Africans to drown in the Mediterranean, okay, against international law. They will not let them come to Europe. It burns me up because we haven't even touched on you know, Euro Europeans colonized Africa. After they had taken all the slaves and the uh, uh, slavery was ended first and foremost by the slaves themselves. When slavery couldn't work anymore, Europeans turn around and say, okay, now we're going to go into Africa, colonize them, take, take their resources. They did it when I was born in Ghana. My country, what is now my, my the country of my birth was a colony of the British. The British were still governing us. So I live in the, under the British empire. Now that it is over, you want to go to Europe, they say, no, you can't come here. A British court there yesterday told the conservative government that scooping up people and taking them to Rwanda is against international law and British law. So my point is another story that I wish will be covered is that how Europeans abuse immigrants from Africa and from the Middle East, not just Africa, by letting them drown in the Mediterranean constantly is horrendous. And I wish it would be better covered because Ukraine tells us that the Europeans look at the United States as their big brother. When they are afraid of Putin, they come rushing to the United States. I've always thought if we organize properly, we need to put pressure on the United States, not only to clean up its own immigration policy, but then to say to the Europeans, you know, we have a lot of Africans here, 40 million uh, people of African descent. If you keep drowning Africans in the Mediterranean, they're going to get mad at us. And if they get mad at us, we can't help you that much. So those are two, just two of the, of the issues that are burning. And then there is the issue of democracy, which uh, we will get into. And yes, I'm, I'm excited to be back. Uh, thank you for having me back. Uh, we'll put our heads together and make sure there is good analysis and understanding of how Africa fits into all these global issues to, to, to uh, the interest, to the benefit of the United States. So when um, the real news pushes for better coverage and analysis of African issues, it is not something you know to the side, it's actually for the good of the US. Because if you are not covering Africa and you don't understand Africa, but Africa is so important, not just the history that Howard French wrote, but for the future, if you are misreading the future, or if you are ignoring our facets of indicators of what the future is going to be, you are shooting yourself in the foot. So better coverage of Africa benefits everybody. And I'm so excited and I cannot thank you enough. So that is the great Ni Akuete. Ni, thank you so much for joining me today on the Real News Network, man. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. This is Maximilian Alvarez for the Real News Network signing off. Before you go, please head on over to therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly sustainer of our work so we can keep bringing you important coverage and conversations just like this. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.